because I play the piano, um, I, I like, this is my hymn book, so I like to, in fact, I have several hymn books, and you know, hymns changed over the years, you know this, correct? Uh, and so I have old hymn books that have oldie moldies in them uh, that aren't, aren't in this one, and I'm sure these, when they came along, were seen as the radical hymns. Um, but I, there's certain hymns I love to play uh, um, because it's just, it's, it's just worship between me and the Lord uh, when I'm playing. I can't play and sing at the same time. That's usually when Liz wants to have a conversation. I'm like, honey, I'm either playing or we're talking. I, you know, and so I, I have limitations, don't, don't you? Nobody does? Awesome. Um, so there are just a few. I'm going to cherry pick just, uh, just, some, uh, just some hymns because uh, hymns have educational value, do they not? As any pre- pre- worship song does. Um, I like uh, on page 140, uh, 748 of this uh, celebration hymnal is, uh, have you any room for Jesus? I used to sing this uh, when I was younger. Have you any room for Jesus, he who bore your load of sin, as he knocks and asks admission at the door of your heart? The sinner, will you let him in? Room for Jesus, King of glory. Hasten now, his word obey. Swing the heart's door widely open. Bid him now while you may. Because time's short, isn't it? Uh, and I remember taking a lot of friends from high school to church. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we'd sing that old hymn. And I would be praying for my friends to not waste time because no man knows when the Lord calls you home. Uh, another old hymn uh, that has great educational value <coughs> is uh, His Eyes on the Sparrow. Uh, and a lot of these hymns, you have emotional attachment to them because they relate back to your life when you experience things. For me, uh, my roommate in college, uh, Brent Fletcher, who's now home with the Lord, he died um, this summer when I was getting ready to move here. He had cancer. Uh, but his mom, a uh, great woman, Glenda, uh, got cancer when I was uh, living with them uh, my junior year. Uh, nice family, great godly family. Uh, she got ovarian cancer when she was 40, 40, 41, um, passed away. But um, when we uh, went to her funeral, uh, they sang this. Um, why should I feel discouraged? This was her song. Uh, why should shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. You know what it says after that? His eyes on the sparrow, and and I know he watches me. So Glenda could say that even as she, as a young woman, uh, was approaching her mortality, she had a joy about her, Uh, because I used to go into the living room and and talk with her when she was in pain, but she she had great joy because she knew that even in this God's eyes on me, so I can go back through the hymns, and some of them I can hardly even talk about. Because when you think back, uh, it, there's an emotional attachment to the worship that you, that you experienced. And uh, the Psalms, you have to think of them in that kind of perspective. Uh, they took the ancient Israelite back to the same type of emotion, the same type of theological value, because they, this was their chorus book. This was their hymnal, as it were. Uh, we've long since lost the notes. We do not know what the note structure was of these, and Psalm 111 is no exception. Uh, Psalm 11 was an an ancient hymn uh, that they sang, uh, and it taught them uh, one major truth. It taught them uh, how to praise God and how to go about doing that. And it did it in a most interesting way. I know it's in English, and you cannot see it, but if you were to read this in the Hebrew text, it becomes readily apparent to you that from the very first verse into the very last verse, they cover every single letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It's called an acrostic. So it starts with Aleph, and then it goes to Beit, and then it goes to Gimel. So Aleph, Beit, Beit Gimel, uh, Vav, Zayin, Chet, Tet, Yod, Kaf goes through the whole alphabet. You see it when you're reading it. So I went through my Hebrew text when I was reading the thing in Hebrew this week, and I'm going, whoa, it's an acrostic. And so I highlighted all those Hebrew letters, and what it, what it does is two things. Because it's purposely written that way. It's alphabetical. So number one, it tells you uh, that God is so great to be praised. He cover, his praise should cover everything from A to Z in your life. Or if you're Hebrew, it's all of the top. It's, it's all of that. But you should be able to think of, uh, uh, and this is a military church, so you really understand the acrostic value of things, do you not? Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, those, those little devices that you devise to de- describe things that we that are in the military don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and, and so when you do, divide as an acrostic, you're covering A to Z, what has God done in my life that is uh, praiseworthy? So I will give you uh, an assignment for you. Uh, whether you're a single person, you got kids, uh, whatever your situation is, you're a widow, widower, whatever your situation is, assignment between now and next Sunday, here it is, ready? You come to church for homework, correct? Uh, yeah, right, I'm not coming back here again. Now, uh, so what should, what should be your assignment? So your assignment should be, to take the English alphabet, start with A, go to Z, 
uh, and put either a word or a phrase in there that relates to that letter, that relates to how God has personally blessed your life. Did you hear me? Do it. And I'm telling you, you're going to be sitting there looking at the piece of paper going, uh, what? Just tell, tell God, fill my mind uh, with what you want me to put on here, and you will be amazed. The floodgates will open, and wham. You will f- Z might be tough, but you could do it. Uh, the other value of an acrostic uh, is, and we'll eventually get into Psalm 11. I'm preparing the foundation. Uh, the other reason why they would create an acrostic is to memorize it. So if you could memorize, you probably did this in college when you created a, a devices to remember a long list of things for test, correct? And so uh, it's kind of like that. So if you have an acrostic and you're, oh, oh Olive represents this, Bait represents that, um, you, you could remember this and you could then sing it better. So it's for memorization purposes, which it must have been really important. So with those things in mind, if you look at Psalm 111, this great acrostic, uh, it is different uh, insofar as um, the acrostic is built uh, on, uh, not on the first verse of every uh, verse or two having an alphabetical letter. It's every clause. So sometimes you have to jump ahead and, and put a couple clauses together to get the gist of what he's saying. We'll, we'll look at that. Um, there's other psalms, like Psalm 119, uh, when we get there in a few weeks. Uh, psalm 119 is eight verses based on one alphabetical letter. So Aleph, A, A then eight verses of Aleph, then eight verses of B or Bait, etc. This is an unusual one because it's kind of built on clause versions of acrostics. It's very interesting. So what does this, verse, this, this chapter teach us? It teaches us that saints, as a Christian, that's hopefully you, uh, should live a life that praises God, and it does it where? You read the word? Starts with P, ends with a Y. Where should you be praising God? Well, I'm an introvert. It should be in my closet, away from people. I don't want to be embarrassed. You know, no, no, it should, be pu- it should be publicly. You should praise God publicly. So extroverts that are sitting here, where are you? Which, raise your hand. You're an extrovert. See, their hands go immediately up. Yeah. Okay. So you're thinking, I am so glad I'm here today. I am all about praising God with my life. Yes. The introverts are going, oh, no. Where's the, where's the prayer room? Uh, I got to get alone. So just go with it. It's, it's, a, it's a command from God to praise God publicly. Um, and so what we're going to do is move, move down through this particular uh, call to praise God publicly, not privately. Uh, and we're going to uh, divide the acrostic up into the three movements that are here. So number one uh, tells us in verse one that your public praise of God should be your conviction. I mean, it's just what you are about. And if I were to sit here and go around the room, uh, what are your convictions, like your top three convictions? Like, what is it that you're, like, focused on? Um, I have lots of convictions. Uh, I was raised in a law enforcement family. I understand crime and criminals. And so, therefore, I lock everything. Don't you? Now, my wife, she's not here, so we can talk about her. She comes to the next service. So, Liz is a much more freer spirit. She's like... You know, it's low crime, who's going to come in the door, it's no big deal, blah, blah, blah. Me, I'll check the door one, two, three, four times, right? Don't you? How many do this? Confess now. You don't? Yeah. I mean, I am like uber about locks. That, that, that is my conviction. If it's a lock, it must be locked. Uh, and and I, even if she went out, like this morning she went out and did something on the back patio, I locked the door. She's like, I'm not done out there. Anyway, so it can become a problem in your marriage. So Another topic. So when you think about a conviction, uh, it could be a good thing. Uh, and when it comes to a conviction of praising God, it's a whole other level altogether. I mean, conviction means I'm passionate about it. I go after it, like they would say down south, whole hog. We just, we just go after it. So what does it say? Verse 1, praise who? Praise the Lord. You sounded so exciting. Well, praise the Lord, you know. You know, it's kind of a bad week. Yeah. What does it say? Praise the Lord. Uh, exclamation point telling you what no praise him i mean there should be some excitement about it you know uh you don't want people coming into the church going well it was a really nice church but man it was kind of dead i mean they should walk out going those people are pumped up uh so anyway uh praise the lord uh because he's the creator of all things uh and the word praise uh is a command in the hebrew text so since it's a command it means it's not a suggestion god's not saying well when you think about me occasionally things i've done in your life you know a little praise would be good is he telling you that? No. He's telling you, praise me. I'm, I'm the Lord. I'm the creator of all things. Uh, and so in Hebrew, because uh, uh, you know this word, uh, hallelujah, uh, that particular word uh, is combined. It's two words, uh, hallel, uh, which means to praise or lift, lift up something higher than yourself. 
Uh, and the origin of it uh, etymologically is from the Assyrian alalu, which means to shout joyously. Not whisper. Alalu, the ancient Assyrian from which the uh, Hebrew derives its meaning uh, based on stems, uh, means to shout joyously. So when you're praising God publicly, it shouldn't be just, oh, I just praise God, so awesome. And he's not telling you that. He's telling you, oh, you can shout to me. So all of a sudden, this is a Pentecostal charismatic church, correct? <laughs> Been in one of those? Well, my first time in one of those. Uh, I was sitting there, a lady sitting next to me, and I'm just absorbing the sermon. So did she. And then all of a sudden, I'm in the balcony. I'm sitting there with some of my seminary buddies, and she's sitting next to me. All of a sudden, she's out of her chair. Remember the old wooden ones? Metal frame bolted to the floor. She got up. That thing folded up, and she was just, yes! Scared me. I thought somebody would call the police, medics, something happened. Uh, she totally understand this passage. Praise the Lord. She got it. So she got blessed during the sermon. Now, don't do that right now because it might, might throw me off my game, but <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so praise the Lord. Uh, and uh, so hallelujah means to uh, praise God, lift him up higher than yourself. Yah is just a shortened version of Yahweh, God's name. So hallelujah, uh, praise God. Uh, so do you do that? Do you praise him? Do you? Seven people are totally committed. We're working on it. There's, uh, yeah, yeah, totally excited about it. So do you praise God? Will you praise God? Have you praised God uh, recently? Uh, again, command, not a suggestion. So now look at the other half of the equation of this verse. Remember, uh, that's the, uh, the first part of the, of the acrostic. The other part starts with a prepositional phrase, uh, which is bait or be in the Hebrew text. So praise him with all of my heart, all of my being, uh, and do it. Notice it's, it's what we would call in grammatical circles, the locative use of the preposition or the location. What's the location of my praise? In the company of, well, two, two kinds of people. Uh, in the company of who? The upright and in the assembly, which will be another version of our church. Uh, so two locations where I should praise God. So let's analyze those two things. Number one, when I praise God publicly, uh, I should do it in the company of the upright, the company of the upright. So this particular word uh, company, uh, sod in Hebrew, means it's a circle of close confidants. I mean, people that you trust and you know and, and you love being with them. Circle of close confidants. So we had an elder meeting yesterday. We met upstairs in the conference room. We hang together. We're close confidants. So we could easily praise God in there, and we do when we have prayer in the morning, which we did. Um, it's, it's an easy place to, to praise God because we're filling the text. Do it in the company uh, of the upright. So this is the company of your close confidants. And then it says, do it in the company of the, of the upright. Uh, upright, uh, uh, yashar is the Hebrew word, um, it literally refers to that which is level. So if you have a road that's level as opposed to a road that's unlevel, uh, there's a place down there on Braddock Road right outside of George Mason University that you can almost lose your front end of your vehicle. Have you gone down there lately? The road is caved in. It's massive. I hit it yesterday and was like airborne. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there should be a massive sign that says bump or something. Uh, it's not level, so it's not biblical, correct? <laughs> Somebody tell the, the road crews. So that's what the yashar, the Hebrew word means. Do it in the company of people who are level. This became a great word for moral people. What, what are they? Well, they're level. They're level as opposed to unlevel, or they're straight as opposed to crooked. And how do they know what is straight as opposed to what is crooked? The word of God tells them. So they live according to the word of God. So translated, when I give my public praise, I should do it in the company of people who are morally following what God says, right? Then it also says, and this can happen, by the way, at IHOP, couldn't it? Do you, don't you go there? Don't you love the options of syrup? That's why I go there. Each pancake, you just trade syrup as you're praising God. But back to my sermon. Um, <laughs> so when you, when you think about praising God, it can happen at a place like IHOP. It could happen at Five Guys, I mean, you're with friends, close circle of friends. But then he says, also do it in the assembly. Oh, that's a little bigger. So the, the, the concept of an assembly uh, is basically like uh, the, the, their version of the temple, uh, where people gather to praise God, worship God, uh, etc., uh, sing song, songs to God. So that would be like uh, our version, as I said, of the church. So do it in the, the concept of the church. So it is okay to praise God be, as you come into the sanctuary, to praise God out in the foyer, uh, to talk to people. It's, it's good to praise God during services. Some people do. It's good to praise God after the service when you leave, not just to go out to the parking lot. Well, it's about time for lunch now. 
Oh, it's brunch because we came to the early service. Spartans has got a really good, no. Praise God as you're going out. Man, that was, I totally, man, I, spirit got my attention today. See, it's, it's praising God and that can happen in the assembly. And so um, don't be afraid of public praise because when you, you give public praise, it builds other people up because their life might have been really hard that week. When they hear public praise, when they hear you giving God praise for what he's done, it puts wind in their sails. And that's what he's saying to do. So it should be your conviction, your passion. Number two, uh, it should be full of particulars. This is uh, verses uh, two to nine. So yeah, it should have a whole lot of particulars about it. Now, when I was taking uh, Bible study methods from Dr. Howard Hendricks back in 1981, uh, greatest, I think one of the greatest educators and teachers I have ever seen on the planet. Man was a communicator. Uh, he told us as students, uh, he said, you must always move down the ladder of abstraction. You can, you can start in abstraction, but you must move down the ladder of abstraction for people to get it. And if you just stay up there, you're just going to sound really smart, but it's not going to mean anything to most people. So you have to constantly move down this ladder, and that takes a lot of thought. That's not easy to do. So when you look at this particular passage, uh, he's telling you, as you're thinking about praising God, think of particulars, not something vast and abstract, God's awesome. No, what has he done that's awesome? Think of particulars, all right? So as you're putting together, remember you have an assignment? What was the assignment? A to Z, or if you really want to get good, all off the top, whatever. Fill it in, put your, get your kids in on it, get them there, share it, share it with your life group, etc. cetera. Um, but make sure you're putting particulars in. So let's, let's look at the particulars. What did he say? So he says in verse two, uh, well, uh, great are the works of the Lord, they are, they are studied by all who delight in them. Great are the works of the Lord. So uh, the adjectival phrase, great, are the works of the Lord, totally emphatic in the Hebrew text. And there's no verb here. So the copula, the main verb, it, the, uh, the is verb, gone. You read it in the Hebrew text, you're like, wow, this is so stilted, so wooden. You have, to, you have to put a verb in there to make sense out of it. Why'd they do that? He wants it to be emphatic. He said, when you think about God's works in your life, it's a great thing. It's a great thing. Uh, he, and he says, you know, when you look at God's works in your life, um, these are like the never-to-be-forgotten things that he's done in your life. Um, they should be studied. I mean, analyzed. Uh, I'll date myself when I say this, but it's okay. Did you watch Columbo? <laughs> yeah. Remember him? The bungling detective. White coat, messed up hat. Just, you know, he just, he acted like he was the most clueless person in the room. He's got his little notepad. He's taking notes. And he's taking those notes and he's studying them, isn't he? And at the end of the show, he just solves the crime. It's totally awesome. See, this should be you when it comes to praising God for the great works that he's done in your life. You're studying them. That's what he's saying to do. Because they are so off the charts, you don't want to forget them. And you want to tell other people about them. Uh, case in point, when I first moved here uh, and was greet, uh, meeting people, because uh, I didn't know anybody uh, on this side of the country, and I didn't know anybody uh, here. Uh, I went to go visit one of our uh, parishioners, one of the charter members of the church. His wife had passed away. I'd met her when I came out to candidate, but then she passed away. And so I went to go visit him uh, out in the Springfield area uh, in the, the condo that he had purchased. Uh, great man. But as I went in there with one of our other pastors, there were huge oil paintings all around his living room. Beautiful. I mean, they were huge. And they were all of like, Navy vessels, like, and they were massive. They were, they were like one-of-a-kind oil, oil paintings. I was mesmerized. And so the logical question as you're sitting there is what? Uh, obviously, you were in the Navy, right? And so he smiled, and he told me, uh, no, I wasn't in the Navy. He said, my whole life, I wanted to be in the Navy. And he said, I wanted to go to Annapolis. It was my life dream, and I got accepted, and I went. And he said, uh, when I first hit the campus, I was so excited to be there. And he said, I was going up the steps uh, of one of the buildings uh, the first week there, and I slipped. And I fell face first, hit my face on a bunch of steps, uh, broke my eye socket, destroyed my eye. They washed me out of Annapolis. I said, that is sad. I mean, tragic. I mean, but he was still joyous. And I go, well, then... God obviously redirected your life and wanted you to do something else. What did you do? He said, well, I looked at what happened, the tragedy, and I didn't get to fulfill that dream. But then I asked God, well, what other dream would you like me to fulfill? And he said, I was really good at mathematics, and I became an engineer, and I became a lead engineer for building Navy vessels. 
And he said, all of these paintings represent all the ships I built. Isn't that amazing? Godly man. What was he doing? He could look around his living room and praise God with every picture that he looked at to say, well, God sent this tragedy to me, but God be praised because he used that tragedy to send me in another direction to do greater things for him. See, that's something that you, that you want to study. And that's what it says. It's study, study the things that God has done uh, so that you can tell other people about them. Verse number three, he says, splendid and majestic is his work and his righteousness endures forever. Splendid and majestic. Uh, so what we have here uh, in the word splendid, uh, it means something that is high and lofty. So that is just amazing. It's used in uh, Isaiah 30, 30, the same word, to describe the sound of thunder. That's how it's used, literally. So when you hear thunder, like I heard some yesterday at my grandson's uh, four-year-old birthday party at a swimming pool, and the rule there is when they hear thunder, everyone clears the pool and leaves the whole facility. So I'm sitting there burning up underneath an umbrella thinking it's so hot out here. And all of a sudden, thunder. Thank praise God. <laughs> but I'm also thinking, man, how great is God? Because that is just such a majestic thing to hear that. It's just the vo like the voice of God. Uh, he says, that splendid and majestic are, is, is his work. Psalm 35, uh, verses 1 and 2. Uh, uses the word majestic uh, of, of those particular words uh, to describe uh, the, the Isaiah 35, 1 and 2. talks about when the Messiah returns, how the desert in Israel will, will flower and blossom and be like a garden of Eden. I mean, it's, it, that's like Jesus. Because when he comes to your desert-ridden life before you know him, and when you come to faith and he saves you, what was sand? Well, Jesus comes in and just, he just waters everything. He just flowers when I was translating that this week, I couldn't help but think, because it talks about transformation of the desert, you know, to blossom. And I grew up in the desert of Southern California. And I remember one day when my grandpa Dorsey, um, he was a, a great man, worked for Southern Pacific Railroad, uh, never had anything more than, I think, a sixth grade education. Uh, he was a Choctaw Indian. Uh, he, he took us one day uh, with his mom, who was a full-blooded Choctaw, my grandma Mary, and he took us out in the desert. And we're like, Grandpa, where are we going? And he said, well, we're going, we're going to go see the desert in bloom. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And so we drove in El Centro, outside of El Centro, toward Mount Signal, into the middle of nowhere. And I don't think they had four-wheel drive back then. Uh, and we're like, are we ever going to return? And we, we came to a place, because they said the desert was in bloom better than it ever had, anybody had ever seen. And we got out to a place where we got out of the car, and we got my great-grandma out of the car, the Indian, uh, with a long black ponytail and her cane and everything. And we headed out into the sand to look at the, the beautiful pink flowers. They were everywhere, mounds of them. And I just stood there as a little kid, and was like, this is unbelievable. I mean, God painted the entire desert. That's what that word means, is splendid and majestic, transformative is his work. So when you see his work, it just takes your breath away, the beauty of it. So when you're doing your acrostic, think back and say, God, show me something just transformative that you did. Help me remember, because uh, I did this at my desk. God, help me remember what you did, uh, and he helped me remember what he did. Uh, in 2008, when I was getting ready to move here, uh, and we're trading coasts, and my friends are all telling me and Liz, you're going where? And you're leaving all of us and everything? Uh, yeah, God's opened the door there. Uh, and we had to leave Amanda. Uh, and uh, she had graduated from high school, wanted to be, go to hygiene school. Uh, all the hygiene schools were, uh, were uh, full. There were no openings. In fact, since my wife was in, in dentistry, we knew that to get into hygiene school from other friends that we had, it could take years to get in. And we're leaving our daughter what's going to happen to her. But we knew we needed to come here. And so we put her name on uh, multiple schools. I think it was four or five schools. Put her name in just to get on the list. One day when I was packing to move here out in the garage, I got a phone call. And this uh, school said, hi, this is, you know, such and such a school over here in San Francisco. Uh, your daughter applied at our school and I'm getting ready to hear them say, yeah, there's no hope there. And they said, um, uh, we had one student back out. Uh, and we had one opening and so we threw all of the names of all of the students on our list into literally a hat. And we reached in and we pulled out Amanda Baker's name. I'm like, hold the phone. Praise God. God had a plan. You cannot tell me that that is not splendid and majestic. Isn't it? Because we're like, we so accepted the call to come back here and God told us, I will take care of your child. 
And he did. You can never forget that because that's a statistical anomaly, is it not? Out of all the names, and God said, I'm going to have her name chosen. Verse 3, uh, his righteousness endures forever. That's why you publicly praise him. That's what his specific thing is. His righteousness do- endures forever. Uh, righteousness uh, comes from the Hebrew word sidkato, which means justice. That's what the word means. That which is just. Think about God's justice. Because it says it endures how long? Forever. So on two planes, God's plane, man's plane, God's justice is like this. Always steady, always true. What is man's justice like? (laughs) Well, it kind of comes and goes, mostly goes. Not God's justice. True justice cannot be bought off. Uh, True justice is always fair-minded and concerned with uh, facts, not feelings. True justice doesn't care about family, who who you are, how much you're worth, what what your position is in said society. True justice doesn't remove people from jobs because you don't like what they said. You counsel them. True justice. I mean, doesn't the world need true justice? Absolutely. When are they going to get it? When Jesus returns. And in the meantime, we as Christians should strive to evidence true justice. But he said, when you think about God, why should you praise him? Because he's true in his justice of things. Uh, Matthew 13, Jesus said this, as weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The son of man, code word for Jesus, will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then, at that point, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. And then he gives you this word of advice. If you got ears, you better listen to what I'm saying. Because one day, I return. And I separate weeds, those who reject me, well, from my people. Which one are you going to be? So he really does bring true justice in due time. And we see the old earth is clamoring for true justice. Praise him for that. Verse 4 said, he has made wonders to be remembered. And the Lord is gracious in commandment. The word for wonders is just the word uh, that is used in the Old Testament to describe God's great actions, uh, like when he parted the Red Sea or when he parted the the Jordan River at flood tide. It It was an amazing act of God, a wonder to behold that when the Jordan River is flowing downhill from uh, the, the Sea of Galilee and going down to the Dead Sea, when that thing, uh, when that thing breaks apart at flood tide uh, and, and, and separates and the ground is dry, uh, every Jew standing there said, this is a wonder. This is a wonder to behold. He made his wonders to be what? Remember them. Tell them to your children. Teach them so that he can be praised. Uh, verse four, he said he's also compassionate because whenever God does something wonderful in your life, like when he did that for Amanda, we as a couple can turn around and say, is not God so compassionate toward us? Isn't he? Just when you feared, God said, no, let me do something wonderful and you will see that I am indeed gracious and I am compassionate. Verses five to six, he says he's also given food to those who fear him. He says, praise God for giving you food. He will remember his covenant forever. He's made known to his people the power of his works and giving them heritage to the nation. They're, they're, speaking of food, he's remembering back. Uh, and they think the psalm was written in the post-exilic times. So he's thinking back hundreds of years to when God gave manna to the Israelites. When they complained and griped and mumbled and groaned, God said, I'm still going to feed you. I'm going to provide for you on your earthly pilgrimage. When you look back at your life, your earthly pilgrimage, how many people planned on moving to D.C.? Awesome environment. We're coming here. No, I've had many of you tell me, never thought I'd come here. I never thought I'd come here. In fact, in 72, we told my dad, I don't care if your friend took a job with Nixon. Do not come here. We drove here and checked it out in July. We knew it was not God's will. (laughs) But anyway, moving on. And then now I'm here. I mean, isn't God funny? Um, so, so, so God does great things. He provides for you, doesn't he? Has he given you a home, a rental, when you thought you couldn't get in a, yes. Has he given you a home to purchase when you didn't think, yes. Has he put food on your table, yes. All of those things, you stop and you praise God for them. He, those are his provision because he's gracious toward you. Verse seven and eight say, uh, the works of his hands are truth and justice. All of his precepts are sure. They are upheld forever and ever. They're performed in truth and uprightness. Uh, there's a a vast difference between belief and truth. Belief changes. Truth never does. I mean, they used to believe the earth was flat and drew dragons at the end of, you know, uh, the map to show you, you go here, it's it's over. No, they didn't change the truth that the earth was not flat, it was a sphere. 
And so when it says that God is uh, truth, he's the essence of all truth, which then naturally leads to all justice. That means that at all times, whatever God has said in the scriptures is true. So whatever he said about anything in the scriptures, about morality, sexuality, anything, pick a topic, all of those things transcend time. They're true at all times, no matter what culture God does. So God's version of truth and justice is, a, is, is, is just perfect. Man's comes and goes. And God says, praise me for my precepts. All of those precepts are sure. You can bank on them. They're, they're upheld forever and forever. So in our particular culture, uh, you could apply it to mathematics. Uh, truth is true when it comes to mathematics, does it not? One plus one is always two. You know, apply it to English grammar. Do you want to divide sentences with split, fin split infinitives, et cetera? Mixed tenses in a paragraph? Uh, no, no, why? There's grammatical rules. Go to chemistry. Aren't there certain rules when it comes to chemistry? Yes. I found that out in high school when I lit our whole workstation on fire with a Bunsen burner uh, on purpose. <laughs> uh, did you do things like that? Insane? Yeah, because it, it's true. There's just certain things you don't do with fire around chemicals. Uh, yeah, I learned that when I was 18. But when it comes to God, there's just some things that are true about him, and they're true at all times, and they never change. I thank God for being that way, because when I look at my culture throwing truth to the wind, because they believe in a relativistic truth, it's just what's well, true to me. Well, so it's diametrically opposed to logic, reasoning, medical data. Well, that doesn't matter. It's true to me. It's insanity and chaos. He says, praise God because he's true. And then he says, praise him in verse 9 because he sent redemption to his people. He has ordained his covenant forever. He's holy and he's awesome. Translated, if he saved you, well, you have plenty to praise him about. Why? Because he saved you forever. Ever. How could you ever look at eternal forgiveness and not say, I don't have something to praise God about? It says he is, he's redeemed his people and he's done it forever. So that le should lead you to sing an old hymn like this. I will sing of my redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh, sing of my redeemer with his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and he set me free. See, to me, I think about he redeemed me and because I play a piano. I just want to sit down and play some songs to him. I can't sing and play, maybe in heaven. But I'm giving God my praise. And then lastly, he says, in addition, in addition to praise being uh, highly particular in your acrostic, it should be prescriptive. And we'll close with this. He says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. A good understanding of all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. You want to be a wise person? Where does it begin? I fear God. Does, what kind of fear? Does that mean I tremble in his presence? Well, it, it could be that because he's holy. Uh, but it's a reverential fear of him. Because the more I understand him and who he is, then the more I pay attention to how I love my wife, how I treat my children, how I treat my grandchildren, how I interact with people in my culture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because why? I know one day I have to stand before that great God and give account. What's the greatest thing a nation can, can do but fear God? Because when they fear God, they radically change how they, well, how they treat each other and how they obey laws, etc. So he says, if you want to be wise, fear the Lord above all things. Because fools don't fear God. They do stupid things. Have you not ever seen a high school student with a skateboard trying to ski down the railing of a staircase? Don't you look at that now and go, that is really stupid. Don't you think that? I mean, it's insane. But that's what some people do with their moral lives, isn't it? With their spiritual lives. It's like they're doing that. It's like, why would you want to do that? That's destructive. And he says, no, if you want to be a wise person, uh, then, then study the word and align yourself with the God of that word and live in light of the fact that his eye is on you and you give account one day. You give account one day. I, I believe I give account one day. So it changes me. And if you're a Christian, it should change you. And it might even lead you to, well, singing about it. And if you're not a Christian, uh, well, you don't fear God. But I would pray you would fear God because the greatest thing you could ever know in your life is him because that leads to truly wise living as opposed to foolish living. So you have an assignment between now and next Sunday, do you not? Right? You thought I forgot. Yeah, now, what's your assignment? I'm gonna, you sound so excited. Well, I got to go home. And No, you're going to go home. You're going to sit down with your wife, your husband, if you're single, that's okay if you're a widow, widower, whatever, get together with some friends, whatever, and your list, A to Z, 
all the reasons why I need to praise God, uh, and then start sharing that. Remember, do it publicly. Start sharing it with people. Build up their faith. Hope you have a great day. There's much to praise for, God, out there. Low humidity, light wind, and it's sunny and not rainy. Praise God. Yeah, <laughs> let's let pray for you. Father, we thank you for who you are. Uh, forgive us when we mumble, complain, gripe too much, and don't praise you as often now as we should. Fill our hearts uh, to full and overflowing with praise for you, for the great things you have done. Uh, and may we pass those things on to our children and grandchildren so they too can learn to praise you. And may those who don't fear you learn to fear you as the holy God, but come to know you as the God who loved them enough to send their son, your son to be their savior. And may they come to know him in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, have a wonderful day.